Good morning. Good morning, folks, and uh, welcome to this year's uh, Macaulay Lecture. Welcome on behalf of the Macaulay Development Trust and the James Hutton Institute. Um, we do go back, uh, these two organisations, quite some time, and I guess what originally brought us together was, uh, was this stuff. Um, Pete from the Isle of Lewis. Um, in the early days, uh, Macaulay's money and the precursor of the Hutton's scientists um, had a focus on improving peat soils in marginal ground for the sake of the local population. Um, I guess the question is, what keeps us together now? And frankly, I think it's still this kind of thing, this same sort of stuff. Um, now, of course, we don't quarry this or set fire to it. Now, of course, we realise its importance in carbon sequestration, its importance in biodiversity, its importance in managing our water resources, uh, and also um, it's important for keeping people on the land too. All of these various aspects of it are aspects that the Hutton is preeminent in studying. And the convergence of these aspects, I guess, and the integration of these aspects and articulating these aspects is, is what the Hutton is preeminent in actually doing. And that's why Macaulay Development Trust is continually happy to support them. Um, relax, folks. Um, you will get your money's worth. That wasn't a lecture. Okay. <laughs> Um, I think what I'll do now is I'll invite Professor Colin Campbell, Chief Executive Officer of the Hutton, to introduce our speaker today. Thank you, Colin. So thank you, Eric, and a very warm welcome from the, the James Hutton Institute also. Um, James Hutton was one of the sort of founding members of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, so it's always a great pleasure for the James Hutton Institute to be present here, and thank you very much to the RSC for hosting this event. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome our speaker, Professor Diana Wall, and uh, for me especially, I actually am a soil biologist, so this is one of the first times the Macaulay lectures really coincided with my topic of specialist interest, so it's a great pleasure in that regard. Uh, in, a, in a short while, I'm going to actually um, introduce Diana and uh, tell you a bit about um, the various honours and things that she's involved in, but I also want to take note that it is International Year of Soil and the the various activities that the Macaulay Development Trust have funded throughout the year have all contributed to that. The James Hutton Institute with many of the main research providers and the universities, the Scottish Government policy groups, the international divisions, they've all cooperated fantastically well to celebrate International Year of Soils. And there's been a whole series of events and initiatives all about raising awareness of soils. And I think Scotland has really truly been leading the way here it started with the Scottish Soil Framework with specific objectives to raise awareness about soils and it's moved on from there and it started to dovetail into things like the land use strategy and I think you know, Scotland really can hold its head high in raising awareness about soils. You would have seen some of the material uh, actually being used for the sort of knowledge exchange and awareness raising in the coffee room and uh, some of the things like the soil characters which uh, sort of emphasise that soil types are very different and just like people they have different personalities. These are tricks of uh, exchanging knowledge which have worked extremely well, they've been picked up across Europe and they're talking about having a European soil character. I think these are all great signs of success of the work that the scientists and the policy and the stakeholders have all achieved together. So a big thank you from me on that behalf and many of the people involved in that are here today. So. Um, to introduce Diana, and uh, I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to read this out, and apologies for that. I'll say something more informally about you in a minute, but I just love the way uh, <laughs> you're introduced here in this um, uh, webpage. And so Di Diana's a university distinguished professor and director of the School of Global Environmental Sustainability at Colorado State University. She's also a professor of biology and a senior scientist at the Natural Resource Ecology Lab at Colorado. And she's been actively involved in research in Antarctic for more than 20 years. And as a soil faunal expert, she's uh, worked in many parts of the world, but the Antarctic has been one of the areas where she's made a, a massive contribution to, to the science of this, uh, uh, in this area. So um, she holds many uh, honours, an honorary doctorate from Utrecht, uh, National Associate of the National Academy of Sciences and Fellow of the American uh, uh, Association for the Advancement of Sciences. She's chair of the Scientific Advisory Committee of the Global Soil Biodiversity Initiative, and I'll say something a little bit about that. It's going to appear in her talk, but it's a really important initiative that you do need to know about. And she's a member of the US Standing Committee on Life Sciences for the Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research. She's the recipient of the 2012 SCAR President's Medal for Excellence in Antarctic Research, and was honored by the British Ecological Society as the 2011 Tansley Lecturer. Diana is also the 2013 Tyler Laureate for Environmental Achievement, she has served as a member of the 2012 U.S. Antarctic Programme Blue Ribbon Panel, a PCAS working group, U.S. Commission of UNESCO, 
and was co-lead author of the Millennium Development Goals Committee. All of that tells you this is a scientist who's achieving great excellence in our science, but is also heavily involved in policy and talking to people who are interested in how we actually incorporate knowledge about soils into the land management policies that we need. Um, this other uh, comment here that I just love actually is um, Diana's one of the few scientists I've ever met who's had a, a valley in Antarctica named after. So the Wall Valley in Antarctica is named after Diana and I think that just says everything about her contribution in that, in that area. And what I'd like to just finish off with by saying informally is that uh, I mean, I've seen Diana speak at conferences in the past and I've seen her uh, at the inauguration of the, uh, um, the, the Global Soil Biodiversity Initiative. And one of the things that's really precious is having scientific leadership. And Diana, what you've really done is provided leadership to an international community who are organising themselves for the first time to address this really important issue. And I think you know, we'll see more of that in your presentation today. So without any further ado, Diana, please, uh, we're looking forward to your talk. Thanks very much. I, I can't tell you what a privilege it is to be here to uh, see so many colleagues that I've known and also to meet some of the faces that uh, have produced such excellent papers that I have read. So it's a real pleasure to be here. I thank you very much for this honor. Uh, as had been noted, um, sometimes we see a lot of things and we see our research relating to them. And one of the ones that I think is, is so important right now is what we're doing with our soils and what is happening in terms of emerging issues in soils that are relevant to everything we do. And so today I'm going to be talking about the common ground that I think soils have with amazing uh, important issues that I think we can find some biological solutions to. And of course, one of these is the sustainability development goals. Uh, this was just talked about, but basically it's a series of Ps. If you can't see this, it's people, planet, prosperity, peace, and of course, partnerships. And I think in many cases, soils have left, been left out of some of these partnerships that are really going to help achieve the goals that have to do with the planet and our people living on it and their hunger and prosperity. And it's a particularly important partnership as has been mentioned because this is the International Year of Soils. And we don't want it to just be over and have no recognition that soils are really critically important to reaching sustainable development goals. And so I think a lot of people know about this and that soils sustain the biodiversity we see. I firmly believe that. We get lots of benefits from biodiversity. But let's go back and see a baseline why I say that we're really seeing a lot of new science, new, new approaches that have really changed the way we see soil biodiversity. And part of that has to do with the 1941 Hans Jenny uh, talk about, or his book about factors of soil formation, where he lists, you know, relief, parent material, climate, and potential biota and time. And he called it potential biota, and then he had this, this sentence about uh, they determine the rates. Now, he also went on to say, and this is kind of the baseline of where, what we knew, that we know uh, very little about the distribution of microorganisms in various soil types. But what little we know, what very little we know, and at this time he said definitely indicates that each soil had its own characteristic microbial population. And when I went back and read this, I thought, my gosh, we knew it then. What have we learned since then? I mean, let's face it. Since then, we've got maps of global land cover. We've got maps of soil types, soil organic carbon, human-induced de degradation of soils, climate, and where is our map of soil biodiversity? If we knew then that we had characteristic microbial populations, why, why is that? Is it because when we look across a landscape, there's just too much soil biodiversity? Is that what the problem has been since 1941 to find out what, where, where soil biodiversity, where these organisms are distributed? Is it because we can take a handful of soil? Is it the spatial issue that we can take a handful of soil and be overwhelmed with the type of organisms, the many different phyla 
the many different species. And in fact, there is this idea that we have really not tapped this biodiversity and it is something that would be a solution because we can look at just the yellow parts up here about the 10 million species or nematodes, 430 species. This is all in less than a meter squared. Uh, and then we start with the molecular techniques and that is what has made the difference is molecular te techniques is only one of the many tools that we're getting to explore this diversity below ground. I mean, let's face it, in 1940s and later, uh, this is the only Nobel Prize for soils. Now, I think some of the organisms that live in soils have allowed their scientists to get Nobel Prizes. The nematode Cenorhabditis elegans is well known for, you know, six or so Nobel Prizes. It, it's a kind of uh, a nematode that lives with snails and moves through soil. But actually studying soils and their soil communities has been lost except for people who are growers and farmers and feel the soil and know about it. And so, you know, have we gotten across what we've learned since 1941? We know now that soil biodiversity is so linked to everything above ground. We know that birds and other wildlife use the soil, grub in the soil, squirrels hide their nuts in the soil, their food is there. We know that soil organisms contribute to soil formation. We've known that for some time, but its importance is just becoming more clear. We know that soil biodiversity regulates the rate of carbon stored, also pathogens in terms of biological control. But I think we're talking about a big bunch of soil biodiversity, and it's hard to get it down to the species level. So for that reason, I think the time has come for a global soil biodiversity initiative and a number of people agree with me, which is nice. And then I end up presenting on the global soil biodiversity initiative, which I think is one of the results of this emerging science, that we know that not only are soils there, but they're dynamic living interfaces, that they're key regulators of numerous ecosystem processes that we, many of us, have studied for a long time. And yet, they're often left out of science and policy agendas. My colleagues who are plant ecologists uh, design global experiments. And when I say, hello, uh, are you studying the soil as part of this global experiment on drought net or nutrient net? Not yet. But I think the timing of the Global Soil Biodiversity Initiative why now? It's very much like the year of soil. I think that soils are center to many of these sustainability agendas, and I come back to that. Certainly, we know about carbon storage and what is being looked at by scientists around the world for the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, desertification having to do with erosion, having to do with climate, having to do with land use. We've got the UN Convention on Biological Diversity that in the late 90s actually had a clause in it that said we will look at soil biodiversity in terms of agriculture, and now they've broadened that. Uh, food security, certainly. Water, clean water. What are the organisms doing in soil? So we could go on and on, but the thing that's tying a lot of, the, at least these four together, is the Global Soil Partnership that is being run out of FAO right now. The Global Soil Partnership has an intergovernmental panel technical panel on soils that's represented by countries around the world that are starting to look at the issues. This is really a major change and we need to support this and see that it works and continues. And then there are others that I'll mention. But the Global Soil Biodiversity Initiative is sitting out here isolated from these because it is not directly a part of many of these uh, international agreements. For example, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, which is a wonderful achievement because it's very much like the IPCC. It is doing pollination, it's looking at services, and we must be assured that soils are part of these services that it looks at. Right now, for example, one would be pollination they look at. There are also new initiatives starting up that soils and soil biodiversity have to be a part of. Future Earth Research for Global Sustainability is a 10-year research program coming. 
That is, or, <clears throat> that is started off with ICSU, the International Council of Scientific Unions. Uh, it's got a, a, Future Earth has a hub of five secretariats, or it's run by five secretariats around the world. It's just starting up, and soils, again, have to be in the attention of any type of multi-complex sustainability issues that are being looked at. And I think we, we are at a place where we can actually see that. So the Global Soil Biodiversity Initiative started just a few years ago, and it is to promote, it was just a time for it to say, we know so much more now than we knew about soil biodiversity. We have moved forward, and I'm gonna show you some of these examples, <clears throat> that we ought to be doing more than just talking to ourselves about, isn't this great that my favorite nematode exists in Antarctica and so far it hadn't melted out? I mean, it's, we've gotta to talk to other people. And so it has grown tremendously. More than 86 countries, more than, more than 850 participants are involved. And I think that, you know, you can go to the website and look. Uh, we try to link to other things. We're welcoming ideas because it's very hard for a small scientific advisory committee that's spread around the world to do everything that people are telling us, and I'll show you some examples later, about what we should be doing. Uh, there's just a few of us, and we're doing this kind of gratis because we really feel that we know a lot now that we didn't know 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And the methods are changing, whether we're using GIS, whether we're using uh, uh, stable isotopes, the techniques, of the, the level of accuracy on some of these machines that we're using allow us to look both top down and bottom up from at these species. So why is it that I think a GSBI now? I think it's three different things and I'm gonna talk about these. Accelerating scientific knowledge, I'm gonna give you some examples of that. I think that uh, we have threats to soil biodiversity and I wanna bring you up to speed on that to a little bit of, 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 and give you a little bit of information because I think every threat now we know affects us or other life. And then, this whole issue of managing, how do we manage the soil biodiversity? How do we actually use it? Is it a new tool in a biological uh, systems, a biologi biological solutions? And I think the, the uh, whole idea of why GSBI can be stated just that we have accelerating quantification of this small world beneath our feet and it is actually turning out to be a very, very large world. We're talking about soil security, we're talking about soils internationally, but soil biodiversity has a lot to do with what we see. So what is some of the evidence for this accelerating uh, scientific knowledge? You may have seen this slide before, I'm sorry I don't have the most updated um, information, but these are publications uh, each year in the British Ecology Journals with the word soil biodiversity. And you can see that 1995 to 2014 at least started off to be a tremendous year. There have been more and more and more books coming forward uh, on where we are on soil ecology and ecosystem services, putting together from gene, what are we doing at the latest level and how does that extend out to restoration of soils? I think the other thing is that we've gone from a place in looking at collaborative, coordinated, and interdisciplinary research. And these are a few examples. We need more global networks of research on soil biodiversity and big questions. But we, we are all kind of, I think, grandfathered in, and I'll say this from my perspective, in a pretty amazing uh, network that is over the Tropical Soil Bio Biodiversity and Fertility Project below ground biodiversity basically, that was across nine nations and funded by the Global Environmental Fund and led by Mike Swift. And I think a lot of us learned then we can do cross-site experiments with standardized methods and look at services. The Global Litter Invertebrate Experiment was uh, an experiment that I ran that was just grassroots and I was pretty grumpy because a lot of people were looking at litter decomposition in standardized ways and getting a lot of money for that, but they didn't want to go any further and look at the invertebrates, so we did that. And you can find publications on this. Soil Service, again, is a regional one. That's one that Helena was involved in. And there have been some ac excellent publications that came out of that that help us our understanding across site 
and across regions so we can be looking. There are biodiversity exploratories, there's Terra genome now that's going on, Earth microbiome again going with Jack Gilbert's group, uh, EcoFinders is an EU project that was over that looked at new methods for identifying protozoa and looked at new methods for identifying a number of things in the size of soil samples. Really exciting and exciting for the young scientists who see these challenges as not a big deal, I just want to do it. So what are some of the things that we've learned in the last 10 to 15 years? And again, I'm, I'm giving examples. I know that you all have, you know, you're known for a lot of this research, so excuse me that I'm just using like one example. It may not be from James Hutton or even from my lab, but uh, here's, here's something that ties into something I heard earlier about what's going on in Scotland. The biogeography of soil bacteria seems to be determined by pH in the Americas looking across sites. So we see different communities. Everything is not everywhere, which is what we thought originally. There are very distinct soils with very distinct bacterial communities. And pH in this particular study seems to show, and it's been replicated to some degree elsewhere. So let's go back and look at this why now, and go back to Hans Yenny. Each soil possesses its own characteristic microbial population. A new advance that I think we could say is we could now add this to Hans Yenny's update of his book. We can recognize now that each soil has its own animal population, that they are not everywhere. And one of the things that we can do is, this is an example that was a GSBI research program that Kelly Ramirez, our former executive director of the GSBI led. This is a volunteer study of Central Park, New York, and there were two reasons to make it a volunteer study. One, nobody was paying attention to soil biodiversity, and we said, well, let's put it in a big city, and maybe they'll pay attention to what's in the ground. And we went, and we just took about three labs, uh, Mark Bradford's, Noah Ferrer's, and mine, and we flew into New York and all stayed in one room and got up the next morning and started sampling everywhere you see a red dot. So you can see sampling to an area, and then we just wanted to show this area that we didn't sample across, in the, in the US this is a big deal, we didn't sample on the baseball fields. Well, yeah, that was, we didn't want to get in trouble. And we had all our permits, I should say that. And then what is the big breakthrough here is that we not only looked at bacteria, but because of these molecular tools, we could look at soil animals, the eukaryotes, in each soil sample. That is something that we couldn't have done 20 years ago. So you can take this, because you're probably very familiar with this, uh, Rob Griffith's phylogeography geog map of bacteria and eukaryotes across land use in the UK, and then overlaying this with questions we have about what happens with disappearing soil carbon in places or our particular land use. These are tools for our future. We couldn't have done this. So that is another reason I think it's so exciting. But then we go to, so what? Just because we have all these wonderful creatures, and you've got to admit they're pretty amazing. Come on, let me see. <laughs> Somebody say they're pretty amazing besides me and maybe Roy. <laughs> Brian Bogue think they're great. <laughs> um, this, is, this is a lot of organisms that we know individually that were studied by discipline. Now, I'm a nematologist. You know, somebody else studies mites. But it's so great to start thinking about the communities of these organisms together. So what do they do? Well, this is the easiest way. This is a soccer field. It came from the EU. 25,000 kilograms of organic matter per year dumped onto the soil through the actions of soil microbes, soil animals. And not only that, but when we get here, what do they do? We can do meta-analysis now of experiments and look to see, do soil fauna make a difference? And just in the literature that's already out there without having to go sample again, we see this and it has been revised and there are overestimates and underestimates since 2013. We know that soil uh, earthworms, termites, ants, roots, penetrate the soil and make channels for infiltration of earthworm populations. We know that it doesn't work all the time. You have to know your soils, you have to know where you are and the particular ecosystem you are to say, 
are these earth earthworms beneficial? For example, in the US, we have invasive earthworm species. We know here that there's something, uh, flatworms, that's invasive. So we have to look at all of these characteristics and know our beast. And we also know that we're dependent not only on agricultural soils for food and fiber, uh, but we also have to have our natural soils, our natural systems, so-called natural systems, for not only other wildlife, but for repositories of species elsewhere. And I think one of the things that we haven't looked at enough is how soil biota relate to human health. The vet school at CSU studies, they have a biomedical program, they study dengue fever, TB, numerous diseases that have a soil phase or some activity and they know a lot about when you talk to them and when I go to the field with them in Mexico or somewhere and say, have you noticed the landscape? What's it look like when you're seeing more of an outbreak of a particular pest that they're studying or a pathogen? They talk about, oh well, it's compacted in particular and water accumulates there and they get the picture but they haven't put it together. Or they may study minerals. The same sort of thing with plant pathology, which is what my degree was, my PhD. I hadn't paid much attention to plant pathology and soil organisms until I moved to California and San Joaquin Valley fever, if you're working in the San Joaquin Valley on any agricultural uh, crop, uh, when I brought those soils back to the University of California at Riverside and put them in the head house and started, you know, uh, mixing them, everybody freaked out and said, whoa, you've got to do that under a hood. You've got to watch out for San Joaquin Valley fever. And people are studying that, but it's very different than studying it with soil ecologists who know something about the soil food web. So is this a problem? I think one of the things that we know is that threats to soil are threats to soil biodiversity. I mean, it's an inherent thing, but we now have evidence building on a number of these threats. For example, this paper, which I think came out of Soil Service with that EU project I mentioned earlier, reduces soil biodiversity across Europe. These are regional statements that can be made by quantifiable experiments that were examined. There are other things. This, this is um, a paper by Rodolfo Dirzo that was in Science last year, where they looked at where invertebrate populations had been monitored. And believe me, there weren't many. I think it was just uh, 47 or 67 percent of what is known in invertebrates has been monitored since 1970. And you can see the huge drop in the um, abundance of these invertebrates. So looking at mean abundance decline, we can see that invertebrates above and below ground have declined, and then that affects. It does make a difference. Here, it's kind of the reverse. You see that if you have high abundance of the beetles versus low abundance, you get lower dung removal. And that is less of that dung going into the soil Likewise, over here, if you have high abundance of nematodes and low abundance, you get less carbon flux going through the soil. This is some work we've done in Antarctica. So people are paying attention all of a sudden to the importance of soil organisms and looking at the connection to processes. And there's many more papers out there that are really exciting. We've known for some time that this, this move from natural vegetation with land use conversion can affect macrofauna, can affect mesofauna, the smaller fauna. This is again a very interesting tool to look at in terms of both diversity and abundance, but we can look at diversity now because of both molecular techniques and because there are networks of people around the world, scientists, who can contribute to this data and to data on what is the primary production above ground. So a question comes up on how do we manage? And there are many people looking at this and we need the knowledge back to use as case studies so that we can tell policymakers, you're looking at this place, here is some evidence on what works. We need, I'm speaking we as in the network of global scientists looking at soil biodiversity, need these examples. In the US, for example, we're very concerned about bees and pollinators, uh, and very little of the work had been done looking at the soil phase of these bees. 
So it is an issue of dollars, but it is also an issue of fertility of crops uh, and having crops continue to be pollinated. We have to, for future Earth and for sustainability goals, start looking at planned and managed above ground biodiversity as connected to the below ground biodiversity. We don't think enough about the two of them together. And I think that is changing. I think the International Year of Soil has recognized the evidence. And this is going to be something that really will work in the future. And I just want to give you an idea, and I have many slides of things I think are cool papers, but these were just a couple where the, the, the top one says, talks about below and above ground signaling between uh, the networks of mycelial fungus and aphids above ground. It's done here. Here is this paper, I was talking to Elena about it last night, that Mark Bradford and a bunch of people put together. And I can remember when this was being discussed because it involved old data from Ecotron experiments in the UK. And here they come out with a study talking about multiple functions of species below ground or groups below ground. And it's, it's an interesting, thought-provoking new hypothesis, but again, it gets to how many functions can we study and know about that actually help us manage our ecosystems? And then, of course, there are questions on how do you get carbon storage in various types of lands? What are the effects above ground and below ground? And I think these are extremely exciting. Now then, I think we can go then and go back to these international policies that I mentioned before and talk about uh, where are the examples that would help these policymakers and us realize that we have come a long way and we have more to offer in terms of soil biodiversity and in soils. I mean, they are one and the same, and so we're trying to get soil biodiversity recognized in this whole picture. And I think this network uh, really can help inform options for sustainability, and we can learn together as a community. Now, there's one paper that I really thought was interesting, not only because of the data and because if you haven't read it, it's worth reading. Uh, but I really liked this one statement, our quantification of the contribution of soil organisms to processes of carbon and nitrogen cycling shows that soil biota need to be included in carbon and nitrogen cycling models and highlights the need to map and conserve the biodiversity across the world. This really struck with me because I can remember being at a meeting in London that Richard Bargett arranged many years ago, and my need was to talk to people about why we need soil biodiversity and carbon and nitrogen cycling models, and I wasn't getting very far. At Colorado State, the particular lab that I'm in has a lot of soil carbon modelers, and uh, I always am trying to push it a little bit more, but what really struck me here was the need to map and conserve biodiversity across the world. And so what have we got to protect? It's very simple, we know this, taxonomic <laughs> diversity, fun functional diversity. How do we do that? We do it through awareness of the data that we've got. We do that through communication to other people, and we do that through this Global Soil Biodiversity Atlas. This is the first time any group has ever seen this. This is, to me, a great achievement you all may be aware of the European Soil Biodiversity Atlas. And then the next question was, why can't we do this globally? This book is about this big. It's definitely a coffee table book. You all will have to rush out and get one. But it has got the most phenomenal pictures through there and tries to update what we know, and particularly what are the ecosystem services that are linked to it. We hope that, um, and this is a rough cover because every time, every time uh, my colleague at the, at the EU uh, Joint Research Center finds another new picture, he says, how's this one, how's this one? And so just two days ago, we got this cool nematode picture that I'll show you in a second. I had to have a nematode picture on the back cover. But what is so exciting about this is we do not want it just to be used for scientists. Scientists have worked hard on this. Many people here have contributed, many people around the world. We want this in the hands of other people to show appreciation. We're thinking about having launches. 
of, in various cities around the world. Here is a good place. i just throw that out. We don't know when, I can't say when this is gonna be finished, whether it's December, and I hope it's not January because I'm on the ice then. But let me just show you some of the things that are coming out of this work. Everything on this that's kind of red-orange is a very high potential threat to soil biodiversity. This is invasive species. It's a com compilation of a number of things, land use, um, um, invasive species, sealing of soils as cities expand, that sort of thing. Then there is a map that's a global soil biodiversity index talking about where there's blue, we would expect to see greater soil biodiversity. Now we know from some work that Brian Bogue has done and Gregor Yates and others have done since, and now that we're looking at molecular databases of all these eukaryotes and, and prokaryotes and soils, that you know, I looked at it and the first thing I wanted to say was I don't agree with that particular, you know, for my particular animals. However, we need these kind of maps so we can get the data to say whether or not that's true and how are we going to manage land. I think this is one of the new breakthroughs and I wanted to bring in also that last year in December we held the first Soil Biodiversity Conference. Now that's passed and you may say why did we, why do I want to bring that up? Because we expected 200 people. As somebody said, we expected Diana and her best friends Sounds like a, a band, but um, there were 700 people there, and I would say between 50 and 60 percent were under 30. They are excited about looking in soils and seeing how they relate above ground. Our next GSBI conference is scheduled for Nanjing, China, and we haven't started working on it yet. Basically, the slate is wide open on that one, so. Any ideas you all have? Uh, my next slide talks about what next for the GSBI. And just to give you an idea of some of the things that people have brought up is, OK, if this is a coffee table global soil biodiversity atlas, when are we doing a real assessment? How can we do this? And I want to just tell you that this global soil biodiversity atlas, I would have never planned to get done in two years, but it's been about two and a half to three years when we announce it. So the community really did come together. I think we could do that. I think also um, we are in need, there are a lot of people who've come up with ideas if we're gonna do drought net across that has chambers that are over grasslands that uh, keep out a certain amount of, of rainfall depending on your global, uh, your global models. There are other questions that we could answer by having a global uh, soil network. One of the big things, though, is that we've had a couple of workshops in, in Leipzig, Germany, that has to do with synthesis of data. Data is one of the, the best things we've got because we know a lot of the people who are involved in the various disciplines, both past data of identifying morphological tools, the morphological and the molecular data, and we're looking at a framework, and I can send anybody who's interested a paper, you can search it. Um, this is something Kelly Ramirez led when she was under the executive, uh, when she was executive director of GSBI. But there are many others going. This urban soil ecology education network is one funded through the US, but has sites, uh, Hickey Satala and a number of people are looking at that one, and it's to get people in the cities looking at soil organisms and also to take data. Uh, there's the modeling, there's mod separate modeling areas now in soils and global soils, and they have also said, we want soil biodiversity involved. You've got to come to AGU or EGU or their meetings so that we can see where is the data, where is the data, how can we use it, and how can it fit into their models to make their models more precise. I think when we take a, a look at what we know, and I've just hit on some of the highlights of all these organisms that exist in soil and go back to the sustainability development goals, no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, on and on and on you will see linkages, maybe not directly and oh we can go in with a marker and know this one, but to go through these 17 goals and then look at all the different targets. It's quite amazing to me where soil fits into those or soil biodiversity. 
And we realize that soil, that sustainability goals are challenging and that soil biodiversity can't take on the world. But I certainly think that we have a missing area in all of our global challenges if we do not consider soil and soil organisms. And I'm often really happy to read this quote by Aldo Leopold, and again in 1941, when they knew a lot, that says, the fact that it's wild flora and fauna which built the soil to begin with may be likewise important to its maintenance. So my message is that the biodiversity in soil and soils support the biodiversity we see. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. A very illum illuminating and uh, illustrative talk and uh, very impressive in terms of the international efforts that are being made in this area. Um, would you be open to some questions sure. from the audience? I think yeah. we, we're I can then point them back to my colleagues in the audience <laughs> who really know the answers. So we'll open to the floor for questions. Sure. Uh, Maggie Gill from University of Aberdeen. Thanks very much for an excellent lecture and um, it's great to see uh, the increase in work on soils um, that's going on, as you showed through the publications. I want to just ask you a bit more about the modelling. Mm -hmm. And while I would totally agree that the need to put microbiota into the carbon and nitrogen cycling models, mm -hmm. there's a, it's a huge challenge, mm -hmm. and the data are not there mm -hmm. yet. It's going to take time to produce a lot of those data. So who should actually prioritise what, uh, how, uh, the emphasis on that work actually going forward. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you'd like to sort of expand on yeah, sure. uh, the networks and how, who yeah. decides what. Yeah, well the, Harry Varekin is leading one network of a lot of modelers, who is Peter, uh, includes Peter de Reuter, and the, the ones that I know of, you know, personally, Peter de Reuter, um, uh, Bill Parton, who's doing soil organic model, Francesca de, de, de I'm losing her name right now. Uh, but there's a number of people who've been talking about this for a number of years and saying, well, there's a 17%, I don't know if it's still 70% different in, uh, the, in the accuracy of these soil carbon models, these global soil carbon models. And if that could be filled to some degree by including a box of fauna and a box of microbes, would that be efficient? Would it work? Uh, so there's, there's various variations. It has been talked about for probably 20 years, and um, God, there's a modeler here, Pete. Um, he, yeah, yeah, I've talked to him a lot too about this. And so, you know, I'm not saying that we need to do it maybe by species, but certainly we know enough about uh, in which soils and where, and so that doesn't make it global. You would have to start regionally to test this. As to who decides, it's certainly gonna be the modelers working with people who can say, okay, I give a quantification index. We've talked, for example, about um, using wood, wood an index of one to five, and then you have, of, of the soil biota, one to five, five being in this situation, we know we're going to get greater turnover, depending on whether your models run on temperature, moisture, some sort of index like that, or, and, the, and the amount of soil organic and the type of soil organic matter. So I would say that A, there are a lot of people looking at this, this new modeling um, network that Harry Varekin is, is presently heading is just a volunteer. You go on the website, you look it up, and it's just a list of models and list of people who are interacting on this. Uh, I'm not saying that that's their first goal because they're looking at other ways to, to get their parameters really working and getting a better fix on, on how these models are going to run. So. That's about uh, all I can give you briefly. <laughs> uh, my name is Aftab Majid, and I am an environmental policy planner in Aberdeen City Council. I'm also doing my PhD, just started in climate change adaptation using ecosystem services, mm -hmm. looking into planning. So my real question is how far we are uh, adopting these measures, these, you're looking at the soil organic carbon and uh, soil biodiversity actually at the local level in urban context, not in the other context like sectoral context. Are we, how close we are, how, how we can 
bridge the gap between the science and the policy at the local and regional level? I think, um, first of all, this is a, you know, an answer that nobody wants to hear, which is it's going to depend because there are urban areas where they're very big on urban gardens. Uh, you know, the, they have botanical gardens and they are requesting more and more information on how do they keep their soils happy. I mean, at least we see that uh, from the Colorado perspective. I think there's another thing that, that basically they're underappreciated. Soils is providing services. So that's the number one thing we're going from. But secondly, I think that there are other areas where not just organic growers are starting to say, oh, I want to do something and I need more science background. There's the urban issues of people wanting to grow urban gardens everywhere. That's a big push. Uh, the second thing is that I think that, that a lot of the people that I wouldn't have talked to before on things like uh, water runoff in cities, why is the water you know, just becoming a flood down the city of Denver you know, when we have a rain? Oh, well, guess what? We've got concrete. You know, how much leeway do we have on the sides of roads? So all of a sudden, we find ourselves talking to people who are interested in sustainable cities much more so than I would have ever dreamed. And they're also talking about ecosystem services in Denver now. Uh, they're talking about near the Denver airport, putting in a whole agricultural field so that people who have to spend time at Denver in the summer can go out and see gardens and little river and you know what's there that they've been covering up. And, and I think that the other issue comes from a health perspective. It's not just you know the, the drought in California, but Lots of people are starting, there have been papers in science recently, and I think these kinds of papers are really interesting. They said there was one where um, kids play in soil, you know, they, they get the, the microorganisms or their, they get their immune system built up to them, whereas if you looked at the kids that were in the city, uh, the city people don't let their kids play in soil as much or whatever, and they didn't have Im immune. You know, that's just one study, but there are more and more and more of these type studies coming out about benefits from soils. Now, likewise, there's the opposite of disease, you know, hookworms, uh, all sorts of, of um, parasites that humans get. You know, I've had pinworm. I I'm, know I'm, some of you who travel uh, various places have probably got, you know, they, you've got your wealth of, of parasites also. But, but some of these do come from soil, and so that's a World Health Organization. But what's been really striking to me that no matter whether it's mineral toxo uh, toxicity or that people are looking at, you know, or deficiency in nutrients and soils in a particular area, iodine in the U.S. and in some states, <coughs> no matter whether you're looking at that or the diseases or the diseases of wildlife and how that may be transzoonotic, types of diseases may be transmitted to humans that have to do with soils, or you're looking at, you know, just, just plant diseases, those are not studied in one place. You have to go hunting through medical geography or medical books, all this. So I think the attention is growing now about what are the benefits of soil to control a food web that's robust and complex. And I think that word hasn't gotten out. So I think our job is to let people know in many, many, many different ways, such as you all are doing here with the International Year of Soil, that we know a lot about what's going on below us, and we need to nourish that and let other people know that it's something to be included in policy decisions. Now, Diana, do you think in terms of we, what we actually need for practitioners in terms of land managers as a, an easy way of measuring soil biodiversity in the soil? I mean, the moment we very familiar with things like soil pH, and you've mm -hmm. shown that has great control sure. over the biodiversity. But I, I mean, I know for a fact mm -hmm. that microbial fingerprinting, taking a DNA sequence, is actually cheaper now mm -hmm. than doing a pH measurement. But we're not using DNA fingerprinting to manage our soils. Yeah. Do you see that day coming where we'll oh, actually yeah. be using that sort of biological diagnostic mm -hmm. to actually manage our soils? Yeah, I mean, one of in in the U.S. In, for example, at least in California in the arid west, uh, one of the things is is very common is you use environmental. Um, businesses and so we're helping businesses by coming up with cheaper and cheaper tools that they can use and if they can use a dna sequence and show a grower look you know just like a ph strip almost we will get there i think we will get there
but a question here and then I'll go to it. Uh, Bill Slee, Macaulay Development Trust. You presented a very compelling picture of biodiversity decline under intensification. Do you have a clear sense of the decline in ecosystem services that are contingent on that decline in soil biodiversity? And second, if there is a decline, what can you do about it to sustain or enhance that loss of services that has occurred? Because intensification doesn't look good. Is there that loss of ecosystem services? What could be done to sustain it? I think that we are all very aware of what um, super intensification does. In the US, for example, adding too much nitrogen, we see it in the Gulf of Mexico. We get eutrophication in waters. Uh, we get kill off of birds, change in composition of, of wildlife we care about and we eat. So I think it, you know, for the whole Mississippi River Valley, it's been very well shown that the farmers that are using too high levels. And so I think, you know, this intensification is, is already, there's research here that is going on that people are doing <clears throat> how much is enough, can we cut down that level and still get our primary productivity? That is not, this is very much like the pH meter, you know, you stick in, here's our pH and we're using too much nitrogen, okay, let me cut this back because A, it will save me money and B, I don't need to put it into the water system, I don't need to put it into soils and affect biodiversity. Mm -hmm. So that's a simple way to have your soil biodiversity. It's in effect for soil biodiversity, even though we're working on water or we may be working on how much more carbon is going up into the air. We can restore that, and there's excellent work here going on. Uh, I talked to Elena, I talked to others about this particular area, but I think that is true. There's recognition worldwide. We don't need to be intensifying as much as we did previously. Let's cut back a little bit. Let's use a measure that we can use and it will have benefits to soil biodiversity as well as, as to water and the other multiple functions that, that are provided there. Helena? I'm Helena Black from the James Flatton Institute. Um, I was interested when you showed your slide about moving from unmanaged, unplanned to managed planned. And, you know, as a soils people, we soils have been managed and planned for a very long time. But like you say, we generally largely ignore the soil biodiversity. So I'd be just interested to get your view, it's almost like a looking at 10, 15 years down the line. What do you envisage managed plan in terms of soil biodiversity? Or do you know of good examples where people are actually starting to utilize different management and planning to actually use the biodiversity for benefit? I would like my colleagues who study plants, whether for food or for fiber, to when they're even thinking about managing, they're thinking about, oh wow, we're going to arrange this in terms of soils. And what I find too frequently, and it may be from only uh, natural systems or ecologists or uh, not so much agricultural growers that know what, what they're doing here, uh, I find that they will plan, test and experiments or uh, putting in a new grape strain or and they're not thinking about what's it doing below ground. They may think, oh yeah, well, will he have more pests or well, let's just go ahead and let's plow it in the same way we did near Fresno and let's put in these plants and they go with that. And then they say, oh my goodness, we're, we're having a different, uh, we, we forgot we're not going to check for it. You know, I'm, I don't want to make a broad generalization, but that's, that's kind of the way I see it, is people obviously think about the food they're going to eat and the things above ground they think about the Rocky Mountains or the desert, and they're thinking about the plants above ground. And so when they're starting to think about how do we conserve, how do we plan, uh, they may hear about what some of the growers are doing with increasing diversity above ground, you know, the, the intermix of trees and plants and crop plants uh, that will have a good benefit below ground. And I'm seeing in you know, I'm coming in on this on a, on a sideline here, but, but I'm seeing that people are being, they're really, really thinking about we've got to design for both, and not just for carbon, they're multifunctions, I'm <laughs> thinking multifunctions. We have to design for water, for clean water, we have to design for less carbon flux, we have to design for, uh, 
less pest above ground, but also below ground. So it's this combination of thinking, which some people have said, oh, that was integrated pest management. And if that's so, that's great. Just incorporate it back in and let's roll with it. And I would say that all the examples that exist that are working in various agricultural ecosystems around the world, we need to have those either through the Global Soil Partnership or somewhere where they're up there and people can go to them and you've got your list of examples. This has worked in this place. You don't have to say it's going to work globally. This has worked in this place under this claim. So that people get a handle on this is the way I can. Okay, thanks. I think, Roger. Should we be doing more to use more uh, traditional protection me uh, mechanisms in the soil? Because if you look at above ground biodiversity, uh, the great movements uh, led by the major NGOs like key biodiversity areas, which are very prevalent at the moment, uh, the underpinning protected area mechanisms like the Natura 2000 system in Europe and many, in many other parts of the world have actually secured if, uh, things not getting worse in some places, although the declines are still there. But we've got that disconnect between protection above ground uh, and no protection below ground. Do you think, therefore, that as part of this initiative that, that you are working on, uh, we should be arguing for instance, with IUCN uh, and with the um, with the CBD COP, that we need to have below ground protection mechanisms as well to make sure that we don't lose any more. A lot of um, persuasive voices that are not mine who are in those arenas that can really help with that. We've tried to have platforms in Rio, and well, we've done it. We've had platforms that have been, you know, sessions in Rio and sessions in some of these other COP meetings that would bring attention, but there are a lot of people trying to get attention. And I think, yes, we need to do that. And, and I think there's data there on the distribution of many different organisms globally in various types of ecosystems. That is one of these parts of this database on how can we pull this database together. And have it, people still have their own data but somebody goes in and says, hey, I'm going to be in you know, East Africa working on this. How does that map up with the global digital soil map or give me an idea of that? We need to put that data together. I'm, I'm sort of interested in terms of, well, at a governmental level or at a statutory conservation body level, do you believe the recognition and the support is there or is there still a need for, for greater work in that direction? I think that, you know, when we think about these sustainability development goals, these are serious, they're big, they're hard, and they're issues that are facing, nobody wants to see, you know, poverty, uh, children growing up malnourished. But I do believe that soils and soil biodiversity have to be taken to the policymakers, that they have to think about it. Because if you blow your economy, which is built on soils, it's going to have a policy effect big time in the nation. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll bring the discussion uh, to a close here. I'm going to invite Erica to, to wind up and he'll also give you an invite to lunch with which you can also talk to, to Diane a bit more about things. But I want to say from, from me, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I find it amazing the world gets wildly excited about finding any sign of life on the planet Mars. And uh, we need to get wildly excited about finding this vast diversity that we have amongst soils, uh, which can, has got many opportunities for us to manage the, the planet better. So, I think it's been a very instructive uh, lecture and very appropriate for International Year of Soils. So thank you very much. And I'll just, there will be some other thank yous in a minute. I'm going to invite Eric up to, to, to wind up and we'll organise those as well. We have a tradition um, yeah. of making a presentation to our speaker, uh, a, a joint presentation on behalf of the Trust uh, and the Hutton. And we're just going to do that now first. Cool. Right. Put the bits. My glamorous bits. assistant. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> first, <laughs> first and foremost, the scroll. Uh, commemorating the, uh, I'll give us the head. Thank you. Thank you very much. And from the James Hutton, uh, and this has become a bit of a tradition of the James Hutton Institute, I think it's a uh, We have here uh, Quake, and uh, Quake is a Gaelic word. Um, it describes this uh, uh, cup, and it's uh, known as a loving cup or a friendship cup. Uh, it's very often presented to newlyweds. <laughs> 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 uh, 
I'm not going to hold you to that. <laughs> um, but we see it as a friendship cup, and it's a way of marking a, a new friendship. So we hope that you stay in touch with the James Hutton Institute and the Public yes. Development Trust, yeah. and that you become a friend. Uh, the two handles are for sharing and passing with your friends. And I can tell you that whiskey tastes good, but whiskey tastes even better than a plate. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, I, I did say earlier on in, in a private session that um, the trouble is that um, soils are not very sexy. Um, I've discovered that they are. In fact, what I've heard this morning is that soils are really the, the beating heart of our biosphere and seriously have been overlooked for quite some time. Uh, I hope that we go out and take the message that they ought not to be overlooked. Um, I have several thank yous uh, to give today uh, to people, most of whom are present, one of whom isn't. And uh, one of them is Jane Lund, who used to help us very much with the Macaulay Lectures. Um, not present today, passed away. Um, beautiful lady, uh, my own personal thanks, my own personal thanks for the lesson she taught me, uh, I must tell you about. Um, at last year's lecture, my first year, I was very nervous before I went on. And her eloquent ways were amazing, formidable. She said, you get up on that stage. <laughs> I miss her. Um, people who are here today that I would like to thank, um, Pam Cassidy and Nicola Strachan from the Institute for organising everything, um, invisibly. Uh, and just, they just did it and it just all worked out really, really well. Um, the Royal Society of Edinburgh for hosting us today. Um, fantastic, um, great venue. And yes, please join us for lunch. Um, but mostly my thanks to Diana for an inspirational lecture on a subject which um, I find personally inspirational, but I know that other people don't, but I think it's important that we get this message out. So thank you very much, Diana, for giving us the message to take out to people. Um, finally, I guess, thank you all for coming. I uh, appreciate your participation, and please take the message out to other people. I know you all represent various constituencies of one kind or another, and it's important, it is important that you do pass the message on. Because it's important that society takes cognizance of what we have heard today. Thank you very much.